Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. About 150 people told me how glad they were to see me, and then they get someone to introduce me who doesn't even know me, you know? That's a great start. <laughs> I, uh, I was talking to your chairman tonight uh, before we came up here, and, and uh, we were talking about Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and I said uh, the only thing that could destroy Alcoholics Anonymous was ignorance and apathy. Ignorance of what we belong to and complete apathy. And I asked Buck what he thought of that, and he said he didn't know and he didn't care. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, my name is Cease. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I'm glad to be here. I'm a year late. I started out last year and didn't make it, but I'm really glad you remembered that and let me come the rest of the way. I, and I'm real grateful to be here. As a matter of fact, I'm grateful to be anywhere. A very good friend of mine by the name of Jack Sennon is speaking at Dana, Saskatchewan, Canada tonight. And you don't know Jack Sennon, and you probably don't know where Dana, Saskatchewan, Canada is, but that really doesn't matter. But he promised me if I'd mention his name down here, he'd mention mine up there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we got that over it. <laughs> But I really and truly am grateful to be in Lincoln uh, because I, w- I was really disappointed when I couldn't make it last year. It was storming like crazy. And mind you, it was a month later, wasn't it? It was in November, I think. And uh, I phoned the chairman, and he said, well, it's storming here, too, so it's here we are. So I stayed where I was. And uh, by golly, I got a phone call a few months later telling me that I was coming this year. So that made me feel very good. I, I'm not going to tell you a whole lot about my my drinking. I don't think it's that important. I'm going to tell you this much that I did drink. I'm not here by mistake. <laughs> I started when I was 16, and I finished when I was 27. And I got right at it. I didn't fool around. I just got right into it. And, and uh, I would suggest if any of you are out there and taking it easy and wonder what's wrong, get right at it and <laughs> get here. And, and because it's a lot simpler that way. I didn't set out to be an alcoholic. I didn't set out to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't uh, just jump up one morning and say, by golly, I wonder what I should do today. By gee, I think I'll join Alcoholics Anonymous. It, it didn't happen that way. I, uh, I got here the same way as anybody else got here, through a lot of heartaches to a lot of people and a lot of heartaches to myself. And uh, not knowing what I was doing and not knowing that I was sick and not knowing that alcoholism was an illness, and just not knowing anything except that booze did something for me. When I was 16 years of age, I I left my home, a good home, because I didn't like the discipline of my home. I didn't like the discipline of my church. I didn't like the discipline of my school. And uh, it was in 1940, and the war just started in 1939, and I uh, I ran away from discipline, and I ran into the Army. <laughs> if you have any teenagers out there that still like discipline, I suggest you suggest that to them. But the first day that I was in the army, I had never drank, to my knowledge. I wanted to be an athlete. I was a pretty good athlete, and I uh, went downtown that night when we got that big uniform on. I went down to the rest of the men, and we went into a beer parlor. And I had a few glasses of beer, and all of a sudden, a great thing happened to me. Man, oh man, I was the most tremendous conversationist you've ever heard. I could talk about anything they wanted to talk about. Somebody came along that I didn't like, and he uh, said some bad things to me, and all of a sudden, I found out I had extra muscles, and I told him what he could do, and then we went to dancing, (laughs) and boy, oh boy, you should have seen me. I was Canada's own Fred Astaire, just for the for you young ones, he was great in those days. And, uh, <laughs> and I just glided across that floor. 
Then I took a gal home, and uh, and I was Charles Boyer and Clark Gable and just all of those great lovers, all in one. The next morning, I woke up in a down at that army, and I was that same little scared boy that had come in from the farm the day before to join the army. But every night, I would go downtown with the boys, and, and I could be what I wanted to be. And alcohol wasn't a problem at all. It was just an answer to a problem. I just loved it. I just loved it, and I thought that's what you're supposed to do. Everybody was doing it. Didn't seem anything wrong with it. And I did very well in the service. I was 16 years of age. I became an instructor and was getting along really well. Uh, but I got kicked out when I was 17. And, uh, <laughs> and I went back home and got a job in an aircraft factory. And, and boy, I was helping to build those planes and with the great war effort and everything. And, and all of a sudden, I realized it now. I didn't fail. I realized that I got responsibility that I didn't like. Uh, too much responsibility, and once again I ran, and I ran away from that responsibility. And I ran into the army once again. And this time I was a genius. I uh, just, every, I knew everything about the army, I'd been in the army for almost a year and a half. And uh, so I, you know, I was, a, I'd been an instructor, and so I walked in with a bunch of recruits, and naturally I was smarter than them. And, and uh, became an instructor right off the bat, and I was recommended for my commission in the Canadian Army. And had I got my commission in the Canadian Army at that time, I'd have been the, the youngest officer in the Canadian Army, but, uh, and I'd love to stand here and tell you that I got my commission, but I got kicked out before I went to officer's training. And uh, I went back to my hometown, and I started working for a newspaper. And... Uh, I had a, a really, really good job. I was in the advertising department out in the street selling advertising, talking to people, drinking with people, home on leave, and it was a great job. But once again, too much responsibility. And so I ran once again from responsibility. And I ran into the Navy. And there I settled down to a bit of serious drinking. And I, uh, I got told them I'd never been in before, and this time I was a real genius. I became an instructor in the Navy. I got recommended for my commission. I went away to officer's training, and I'd love to stand here and tell you that I was an officer in the Canadian Navy, <laughs> uh, but I got kicked out of officer's training. <laughs> it, it seemed that it was another officer didn't uh, appreciate me telling him what to do with his ship. <laughs> and, and I was in Florida, and I saw some of those big ships go by, and really it's a physical impossibility to do with that ship without going to do it. <laughs> I didn't get kicked out of the Navy. I just got kicked out of officer's training, and, and I became a gunner on a merchant ship. And uh, the reason I became a gunner on a merchant ship, because there weren't any officers on the merchant ship, just merchant Navy officers, and we were just assigned to their ship as gunners, and we had a, a leading seaman as our boss, and, uh, and that was great. And that's what I liked, and that's the reason I went there, was because I didn't like the discipline of the Navy. And so... Uh, I sailed all over the world, got drunk all over the world, got married when I was in the Navy, and I'd love to stand here and tell you that I was a great father and a great husband, but I wasn't. I was an alcoholic father and alcoholic husband. And mind you, I still have that same little lady that I married in 1943, so I must have done something right or she did something right or something, but uh, that, that's, uh, that's a miracle in itself. But when I came back from the service, I uh, started celebrating the end of the war, I celebrated the beginning of the Korean War. I probably celebrated the end of that. And the last two years that I drank, I became a fighter. I had, uh, I think it was 17 fights and 17 knockouts, and I lost them all. <laughs> <laughs> and I, but I wasn't fighting in any ring or anything. I was just fighting in bars or anywhere because I'd become very arrogant, and I was just, I was just pleased with myself. I didn't like myself, so naturally, when you open your big mouth, you... You, uh, the, these things happen. I was also, I did a lot of gambling in the service, and I kept on gambling when I came out of the service. Whoops. Is it gone? No. I can't. This is a tricky thing. I wouldn't care if you'd paid my expenses. I'd just stop. <laughs> Well, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Where'd you use it? I didn't do a thing. I'm not going to touch a thing. Don't touch. <laughs> and I was gambling. You thought I'd forget, didn't you? <laughs> and... And that got me in a lot of trouble, and I mentioned that because I mentioned fighting and gambling because that's what got me to Alcoholics Anonymous. The last night that I drank, I got in a game of poker, and I uh, did an unforgivable thing. I got caught cheating. <laughs> it's okay to cheat, but don't get caught. <laughs> and the guy that caught me weighed 275 pounds. He was an ex-commando in the Canadian Army. And he and I had a fight. <laughs> or I should say he had a fight. <laughs> he hit me and I hit the cement floor and I got up and he hit me and I hit the cement floor. We did that a whole bunch of times. <laughs> and uh, finally, I just stayed down. Not because I didn't move, didn't want to get up, because I couldn't get up. And I went into the hospital. And uh, that's the last time that I drank. Because in that hospital, nobody came to see me. My family didn't come to see me. I, I'd like to think that nobody knew I was there, but I know now that somebody did know I was there. But friends or family, nobody came. Except my little doctor who I'd been in the service with, and the fifth day I was in the hospital, he sat down beside me and he said, Cease, I can't do anything for you. I've built you up physically. And he said, the only thing that uh, I can do for you is something that somebody should have done for you a long time ago. He said, you would have had your commission in the Canadian Army if you hadn't drank. And he said, I believe you're an alcoholic. And I said, well, what should I do? And he said, well, I would suggest you join Alcoholics Anonymous. And he didn't leave it at that. He went out and he got a couple of fellas to come to see me. And they came up to see me in that hospital. Now, I was in a, a Catholic hospital. And really and truly, that's the reason I'm an alcoholic. It's because uh, I'm a Protestant, <laughs> and I grew up in a Catholic community. <laughs> and uh, I know all about those resentments and everything before I ever came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Before I ever had a drink, those Catholics treated me bad. <laughs> and uh, they used to call the bingos in Latin so I couldn't understand them. And, you know. <laughs> and here I am in a Catholic hospital with a bad check. This is before Medicare in Canada. And uh, I wanted a private ward, naturally, and I give a bad check for it. And about the fourth or fifth day that I was in there, that little Catholic nun, she came to see me, and she couldn't find, seem to find a place to. She was pretty nice about it. She said, are you sure you wrote the, this check on the right bank? <laughs> and uh, I think she tried them all, but she couldn't find a bank or any money in. And... Uh, these two fellas came up to see me anyway, and they came, and uh, I knew both of them. I had drank with both of them. And I remember this this guy, his name was Bill, and and he uh, came in, and, and Bill was probably, without a word of a lie, he was probably the sloppiest drunk in all of Canada. And he came into my room, and he had a nice brown suit on, silk shirt, and bow tie, his hair was combed, his shoes were shined. And he was clean. <laughs> and I just knew that something had happened to Bill. And I, he didn't have to talk because I knew that something had happened to him. Mind you, he talked and he talked loud and I tried to shut him up, you know, because I was afraid the rest of the hospital would hear him and I didn't want anybody in there to know what I drank. And, uh, he was, he was telling me all about this Alcoholics Anonymous and, and the other guy's name was Daryl. Earl, rather. And, and he, uh, I'd been in the service with Earl, and he got in some trouble when he came back from overseas, and he got hit a taxi driver in the head, and he got charged with robbery and violence, and he got sentenced to five years in prison in our town, and uh, he found Alcoholics Anonymous in, in prison. And he, too, looked good. And I mention that because I think it is so important when we go to see somebody that we look good. Now, I don't mean that we should have a $700 suit on or a nice jacket or something like that, you know, a different type or anything. I don't mean you, you got to have that. But I do think that you should look good. And like these guys did. Because they impressed me. They really impressed me, the fact the way they looked. And I'm grateful for that. And uh, they told me that they were going to have, they wanted to see me at a restaurant in downtown Prince Albert 
at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. But I couldn't get out of hospital because I owed this bad check. And finally, I phoned the only person in the world that my credit was any good with, and that was my bootlegger. And he drove a taxi, and he came up and bailed me out of hospital. And he drove me to this cafe that I was supposed to go to, this restaurant, and uh, probably had he known what I was going to do, he'd have left me there, because I've never had to give him any business since that date. I went into that restaurant, and I sat down with a bunch of fellas. I wish you could have seen me that morning. I've always liked nice clothes. And I still like nice clothes. But today I pay for them. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I was sitting there and my suit was torn. There was blood on it. My shirt was torn. There was blood on it. And I had my coat collar up, my overcoat. And, and uh, so they wouldn't see the way I was dressed. And, and uh, they came in and I knew every one of them. There were perhaps 14 or 15 of them, a whole group in my city. I come from a city of about 35,000. And they just had one group there at that time, and they all came. I guess they had a live one. And they decided to come, and they weren't going to let me go. And man, oh man, did I ever like those people. I liked them right off the bat. They said things that I understood and I really, really appreciated. Now, I had been to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting before that. I was to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting when I was 27 years or 25 years of age. I had a business in a small town. And uh, I was playing a lot of ball. I went away to a ball tournament, and uh, uh, some of the ball team must have left before the tournament was over or something because they got home ahead of me. And my little wife was narrow about that, and, and she took my wife, my two little girls, and left me in a small town and went back to the Prince of Saskatchewan. I, I had a partner in his business, and I went down to tell him what happened, and he threw me out of the business. And... Uh, you know, some days you just have a bad day. This was <laughs> this was before 10 o'clock in the morning, you know. <laughs> like I heard about a, a, a doctor phoning one of his patients up, and he said, I got some good news and some bad news. He said, first of all, for the good news, he said, you only have 24 hours to live. And the, doctor, the patient says, well, what can be the bad news? And he said, I was supposed to call you yesterday. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's about the way it was that day. And I was standing on that street corner, and a fella came along from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and he stopped. He knew me, and I knew him. And he said, do you want to ride? And I said, sure. And he said, where are you going? And I said, it doesn't matter. Just get me out of here. And I rode. He, fortunately, he was going into Prince Albert. I rode into Prince Albert with him. And that night, I knew where there was a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I went. But they talked about things that just didn't identify with me. They talked about mental hospitals, jails, no soles in their shoes, and stuff like that. And, and I thought, my God, I, I don't even belong in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can remember leaving that meeting and going out that night and, and walking home and, uh, you know, thinking... I guess I probably that's the loneliest night that I ever spent in my life because I thought, my God, I don't even belong in that thing, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't think too much of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'll tell you, it was the last resort. And I drank for two more years. And that's when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, when I came out of that hospital. I was 27 years of age. I owed $6,200. I was all beat up. I uh, went to that meeting in that little restaurant. And after the, the meeting, a they, uh, couple of guys said they wanted to take me home, and I said, no, I could get home by myself because I didn't want them coming home because my wife was very, very, very narrow about me being away for four or five days. And she used to scream and yell and say bad things when I came through the door, and I thought, my God, I just found some friends, and I'll lose them if they come home with me if she carries on like that. Fortunately, that was before al -Anon in our city, but some of the wives, all of the wives, used to go to the meetings with their husbands. They had mixed meetings. And uh, so they knew a little bit about this thing, and they went, they'd been up to talk to Babe. And I can remember going through that door, and oh, just waiting for that, you know, just waiting for that deal to come, you know. And, and she put her arms around me and kissed me and said, Hon, I think everything's going to be okay. I want you to know that that kept me in Alcoholics Anonymous for a little while. I thought, if this can change that lady that way, <laughs> I'm for it. And, uh, see, I didn't want to come here. I didn't want to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was something like the, uh, 
The three alcoholic rabbits. I don't know whether you have alcoholic rabbits down here or not. But we have them up in Canada. I don't mean Saturday night drunk rabbits. I mean real, genuine alcoholic rabbits. They set out in, up in Canada. Our country is very similar to this. Down by the fences and the wheat fields and their ears drooping down, you know. And there were three of them. And they were called Foot and Foot, Foot and Foot, Foot, Foot. <laughs> and Foot, Foot used to phone them Foot, Foot, Foot and say, let's spin a roll Foot and we'll go down to the bar. So Foot, Foot and Foot, 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 pick roll Foot and they'd go down to the bar. So one night Foot, Foot was sitting talking to Foot, Foot, Foot and Foot, Foot, Foot said to Foot, Foot, he said, where's Foot? And Foot, Foot said to Foot, 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 he said, well, he's here just a minute. We went outside. So Foot, Foot, Foot and Foot, Foot, they went outside. They found poor old Foot and Foot was dead. So Foot, Foot said to Foot, 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 he said, what do you think we should do with Foot? And Foot, Foot, Foot said to Foot, Foot, he said, well, we think we should take him to the funeral home. So after the funeral, Foot, Foot said to Foot, 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 he said, what do you think old Foot died from? And Foot, Foot, Foot said to Foot, Foot, he said, well, I think he was an alcoholic. And Foot, Foot said to Foot, 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 he said, well, do you think we're alcoholics? And Foot, Foot, Foot said to Foot, Foot, he said, well, we're drinking quite a bit. So Foot, Foot said to Foot, 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 he said, do you think we should join Alcoholics Anonymous? And Foot, Foot, Foot said to Foot, Foot, might as well, he says, we got one foot in the grave anyway. <laughs> <laughs> And I was something like the alcoholic rabbit. You know, I, I, I thought you had to have one foot in the grave before you came here. And, and, but that night, we went to our first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, they picked Babe and I up, and they took us down there, and I can remember it was on, right in the main drag of our town. And at that time, people used to go to the shows at night and then go window shopping. I don't know, they don't do it anymore, but they used to do it then. And uh, they were all coming from the show. And we're going to this AA gap. <laughs> and uh, and they're standing out there and they're talking to people. You know, we all know each other in our city. And, and they're talking to people who are coming from the show. And, oh, uh, my God, you know, it's all right to go to AA, but you don't have to be talking to everybody, you know. And I don't know what they're talking about, but I was sure they were telling them that we're all going to this AA meeting, you know. And so finally I just grabbed Babe and pulled her in the door. And, and we went upstairs to this meeting and and they had a social. And I'll never forget that night. Before the meeting, they had a social. It was a Saturday night. And uh, they played games. But I, I don't know what games they played, but I remember them playing pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> now, that really wasn't my idea of a Saturday night, I'll tell you. You know? <laughs> and, and there were a bunch of old people there. My God, some of them were 45, 50 years old, you know. Just <laughs> horrible. I thought... What am I getting myself into, you know? I was 27, and, and uh, I thought, my God, I, I don't know whether this is where I should be or not. But I can remember after the meeting, a couple of the old-timers who were sober about 18 months, they uh, took me in another room, and they said, See, you heard us say tonight, and they, at that time they used to say there's no must in Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank God we don't say it anymore. But they said there's no must in Alcoholics Anonymous, but they said tomorrow morning, there's a breakfast meeting here at 8 o'clock, and you must be here. <laughs> and, and I'm glad they talked to me that way, because that's the only language that I understood. And I, you know what? I went to that breakfast meeting, and I've never stopped going. Anybody that's ever been to Prince Albert know that I go to two meetings a week in my group, and to many meetings on weekends where I'm speaking. And uh, I just, that's the way it was. And I can remember that night that, this Bobby Motherwell, he put his arm around me and he said, Cease, we want you and we need you and we love you. And I knew that nobody wanted me and I knew that nobody needed me. And my wife had informed me that nobody loved me. And so, but here's a little guy telling me this, you know. And, and tonight if you see anybody that's standing there and looking a little bit down in the dumps, you know, share that with them. Because it meant so much to me. And I'll tell you, we had a good time. We probably stayed there till 1 o'clock in the morning or something. And the next morning, I was at that breakfast meeting, and I'm still going. And that's the great thing about Alcoholics Now. That was January the 16th, 1952. Because of you, because of a power greater than myself, because of a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, I have never had to have a drink. And for this, I'm truly grateful. It's just been something else. I've never missed meetings. I've done what they asked me to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been very, very active in service. And it's just been great. I found what I wanted in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think if there's anybody in here that is having a difficult time, I think if you give it a chance, 
you will find what you want in Alcoholics Anonymous if you give it a chance. Because you see in this big book called Alcoholics Anonymous, when you start reading it, it says, in the doctor's opinion, it says men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the truth from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented. And that's what I was. I was restless, and I was irritable and discontented. If I was here, I was restless. <laughs> I was irritable, and I was discontent. I want to go somewhere else. I wasn't going anywhere because I got there. I was the same way. And I came to this program, and, and, and they read that to me. But a dear old fellow by the name of Jake said, Cease, if you will do what you t we tell you to do, you will no longer be restless, irritable, and discontented. And I started out to try to do that. But for the first little while, in Alcoholics Anonymous, I stayed sober just by pats on the back. I was the youngest man in the group. I was in the youngest man in the whole province of Saskatchewan. And I want you to know the province of Saskatchewan is a big province. Otto is here from Dallas, and it's probably about three times the size of Texas. I just thought I'd throw that in, Otto. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we went to all of these places. And I got pats on the back just because I was sober. And they're saying, you're doing a fine job, young fellow. You know, and I'm, that's no big deal anymore to be an AA when you're 27. But back in 52, it was a big deal. And I just had a good time. And I was just really enjoying Alcoholics Anonymous. And then a terrible thing happened in our group. Some younger members came in. <laughs> <laughs> and they walked right by me and went and talked to those older members. <laughs> and the older members walked right by me and went and talked to those younger members. And all of a sudden, I'd become a middle member. Now, I don't care whether you're an Al-Anon or al or Alcoholics Anonymous. One day, you're going to be a middle member. And it's a bad thing. It's just like being a hole in a donut. You're nothing, you know. You just stand out there. People walk by you. And I really thought about going out and coming back in and maybe, uh, you know, practicing a little bit out there and getting the same treatment I got that first day. But thank God I didn't have to do that. Because we have discussion meetings where I come from. We had a fellow by the name of Ernie Sear. And Ernie had had a lot of trouble in Alcoholics Anonymous, and finally somebody had got a hold of him with this big book, and they'd started to study the big book, and they'd started to do certain things. And we asked Ernie to chair our meetings for three months. And Ernie said, well, I'll chair the meetings, providing we do one thing. And we said, what's that? And he said, we will go through the steps as a group, and we'll do them as a group. We won't talk about them, we'll do them. And he said, I don't care who comes into Alcoholics Anonymous, Ernie said. He said, we will sponsor them properly, lead them by the hand, and the next time we start going through the steps, they too can go through the steps. But we're going to do the steps as a group. And we thought we would sort of humor all learning along, so we went along with it. And that's the experience I want to share with you tonight, the experience I've had since coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. The greatest experience of all of my life. And I can remember going to that first meeting and Ernie having his big book called Alcoholics Anonymous. And he, he made us, for the first week, he made us read the first 57 pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can remember Ernie saying one thing. He said, find out what you belong to. Find out what is wrong with you. And he said, then we can do something about it. And we didn't know any better. We just went and read the first 57 pages. And then we came back, and Ernie started on that first step, where we admitted we're powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. I knew the first part of the first step, but I didn't even know there was a second part to it. I just admitted I was powerless over alcohol. And then Ernie said, our lives had become unmanageable. And, you know, uh, it, it was quite a thing. Because I started to think, and, and I found out that I had an unmanageable life as far as money was concerned. Now, I know none of you people even know what I'm talking about down here, but I came to Alcoholics Anonymous owing $6,200. And I hate to mention small sums like that, because you all probably have that in your hip pocket and your purse. But uh, 
I came on this money, and I didn't owe it to anybody for anything. You know, I just owed it. <laughs> and I, I came by way of a poker game, so I owed it to some strange people, too, some of them. And, and here I was in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I figured, well, I'll be getting along now, and I'll get this thing all squared around, but I, I wasn't doing that. And I, I, I got myself a really good job, a real fine job. First nine months, I was in Alcoholics Anonymous. I ended up with an excellent job. And uh, my boss got sick and tired of listening to phone calls and him getting phone calls about the money I owed. And he took me to a bank. And I can remember him sitting down there, and this doggone bank manager had been a bank manager in this little town where I'd had the business before. And so I'm sitting there with my boss, Alec, and, and this bank manager said, You know, Corgill, I wouldn't lend you $6,200 even if Alec endorsed the note. You know, it just hurt me deeply, I'll tell you. You know, here I was, a, a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous and trying to do the right thing, had a good job and saving my, the souls of a lot of people, and, and, and here he's treating me this way. Well, I guess Alec threatened to buy the bank and fire him or something because uh, we got the money anyway. I should say Alec got the money. I didn't get it. They, they wrote checks. They had the list of the people I owed money to, and they wrote checks and sent the money out. But they made Babe and I sign a piece of paper that we would pay cash for everything. We would never charge anything again, and uh, that we'd get along all right that way. Three years later, he bailed me out once again for $7,500 because I had an unmanageable life as far as money was concerned. And then I found something that... Really, I know that a lot of you people don't even know what I'm talking about. But I found out that financial problems had nothing to do with money. I found out it had a lot to do with big shotism. I found out it had a lot to do with pride. I found out it had a lot to do with ego. See, I was the kind of a guy, if I owed you $400, I wanted to walk in and pull the bankroll out and slap the dough down and say, there's your lousy money, you know. You'd lend it to me, but I was upset about that. I had too much pride to go and say to you, I can only afford to give you 40 or $50 this month. The ego got in there. I was the kind of a fella that if my wife and I walked in to buy some furniture and they said, we have a nice piece here for $369. <laughs> I was a big shot then. And I would say, do you have some for about 700 You know, I didn't have the money to pay the down payment on the 369 you know. <laughs> but this is something, this is the sickness of alcoholism. Now, if any of you have this problem, and, and I know that none of you have, but supposing you sponsor somebody one day, and he's got some, he or she's got some financial problems. You say, well, I heard a little fellow from Canada talk about that, and, and maybe we can listen to his tape or something that will help you. You see, financial problems can cause you a lot of trouble. I didn't stop gambling because I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I just figured I'd be a better gambler. I didn't stop playing those ponies. And I'll let you in on a little secret. You can lose money sober. <laughs> I didn't think that was possible. <laughs> and I got into financial problems that way, and I can remember going home one day. By this time, al had started in our town, and my wife was going to al -Anon. And by this time, I'd become an eye specialist, you know. I can do this, and I can do that, and, and then I'll listen. And I'm sitting there with my two little girls and my wife, and... And you know how sneaky these al become after a while. And uh, she said, I thought you said you uh, paid so-and-so. <laughs> and you know what I said? I said, if, if I <laughs> said I paid them, I paid them. <laughs> and she said, well, why would they phone me this morning and tell me that you haven't paid them? <laughs> and you know what the big shot did? I got, took my plate of food, threw it about from here to the front row and in the sink. Broke the plate, got up like a screaming idiot, ripped the phone off the wall, and told my wife they'll not be phoning you anymore. <laughs> Isn't that good? That's the only way to handle things like that. And, and then I went in the front room and pouted. <laughs> yeah. and, and so you see, these financial problems can cause a lot of other problems. But to show you that I've changed just a little bit, a lot of years ago, I owed a manufacturer $10,000. Not a lot of money in my business because I'm in the fur coat business. But it's a lot of money in the middle of July when it's about 96 above. 
<laughs> and not sell me any of those garments. And this fellow was writing me letters and saying bad things to me and, and uh, threatening me. And so finally I decided I'd write him a letter, and I, and I wrote him a letter and said that I, I would like fall dating on his merchandise. I loved his merchandise. I'd sold some on the layaway plan, blah, 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 blah. And then I threw a little philosophy at him. I said if I had ten miles to walk down a railroad track, it would take a long time. But if I took it a telephone pole at a time, it would even take longer, but I'd finally get there. Signed it yours truly. Cecil Lee Corrigo, manager, Cease Corrigo Furs and Fashions. P.S. I'm enclosing a check, a certified check, for $100. And I sent it off. About four or five days later, that's when the post office was operating properly. I, I, got, I got a letter back. And he congr congratulated me on my letter writing ability. He suggested I get out of the fur business and go writing letters for somebody. And he signed it, yours truly, Mo Amsel from Amsel and Amsel, Montreal. P.S. Would you mind sending me another telephone call? <laughs> and I've sent him a whole bunch of telephone calls. Matter of fact, I owe him some telephone calls probably right now. But it doesn't matter. Because I learned something from that transaction. And I've, I, today, I, if I owe you $400 and I can't afford to pay you $400, I'd go in and tell you. And I appreciate when people come into my place of business and say, see, this is all we can give you this month. But you see, that big shotism, that pride, prevents us from doing that and gives us a bad time. I had other problems as far as an unmanageable life, but, but that was the one that got me in the most difficulty. And then they said, <clears throat> came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And Ernie read the, out of the big book, he read We Agnostics, and I found out a whole lot by reading that about a power greater than myself. And then <clears throat> I, uh, I still was, you know, kind of rebellious about this thing. And you know, when you're rebellious, you really don't care about the consequences, do you? You just, you're rebellious. I know that some of you people will identify with this. There's a story I like to tell about a fellow that had a little Volkswagen business. And he used to draw a line, and the people used to have to drive up there, and then he'd come out and talk to them and and uh, find out what was wrong with their car and then try to repair it. But this one guy used to drive in, roar over the line, and go to the back and talk to this little guy and, oh, just upset this little fellow. So one day the little fellow come out and he drew a line or a circle in the cement, and he said, now you stand in that circle. I'm sick and tired of you. He said, you stand in there until such times I tell you to get out. And with that, he took a sledgehammer and started to total the guy's car. He just hit it and pounded it. And he looked over and the guy's laughing. <laughs> and so with that, he just totaled it completely. Just boom, you know. And he said, what kind of a character are you anyway? He said, you know, I, I totaled your car and you stand there laughing. He said, yeah, but you told me not to step out of this circle. While you were doing that, I stepped out three times. <laughs> you see, we don't care what the consequences are as long as we do what we want to do. And so they said that they told me that I could find a manager in step two. I had an unmanageable life in step two, I could find a manager. So they talked about restore me to sanity. So I'd never been in a mental hospital. I'd never been, you know, in any of these places. And, and so I said, well, how can I come back from somewhere I haven't been? <laughs> and they said, well, see, that's not what it's talking to you. It's talking about restore you to sane thinking. And they said, you are a negative thinker. And I was a negative thinker. I'll tell you what, when I talked about people like you, did you ever, did you ever uh, listen to four or five people in Alcoholics Anonymous or in Al-Anon? Uh, trying to help somebody that's not there. <laughs> and they say things like, have you heard? <laughs> you know, did you know? <laughs> Isn't it awful? And boy, oh boy, I could stay in those conversations all day long. <laughs> when it was raining and the crop wasn't coming off, oh boy, I was all for that. Anything negative, I was in there. You know, I was a real negative thinker. And, and I think that a lot of us, I saw some of you laughing. You've been there, too. I was something like the negative barber. This guy slid into a barber chair one day, and he said, like a haircut last week for three weeks. Barber said, why three weeks? And he said, I'm going on a trip. Barber said, where are you going? 
Well, first of all, he said, I'm going to London, England. <laughs> the barber says, you're not going to London, England. He said, I am. He said, you're not. He said, I am. He said, I wouldn't go there if I do now. He said, I've never been there. He said, but I heard. <laughs> it's a lousy place to go. Too many people, too many cars. The guy said, look, I just cut my hair. If I don't like it there, I'm going on to Paris. The barber says, you're not going to Paris. He said, I am. He said, you're not. He said, I am. Wouldn't go there if I were you. He said, no, I've never been there. He said, but I heard. He said that they really fleece the tourists. The guy said, look at I don't care. If I don't like it there, I'm going to Rome. And the barber says, you're not going to Rome. He said, I am. He said, you're not. He said, I am. Wouldn't go there if, you, if I were you, he said. Now, he said, I don't know. He said, but they tell me there's a lot of Catholics there. <laughs> I said, it don't matter. He said, I'm a Catholic. Yeah, but he said, I heard there's a different kind of a Catholic over there. So three weeks later, the guy slid into the barber's chair. The barber said, how was your trip? He said, it was good. He said, it wasn't. He said, it was. <laughs> he said, you didn't go to London. He said, I did. He said, you didn't. He said, I did. He said, I'd love to stay there long. We wanted to get on to Paris. He said, you didn't go to Paris. He said, I did. He said, you didn't. He said, I did. And he said, I'd love to stay there long. But we wanted to get on to Rome. He said, you didn't go to Rome. He said, I did. He said, you didn't. He said, I did. As a matter of fact, he said, I got an audience with the Pope. And he said, you didn't. He said, I did. And he said, you'll never believe what happened. He says, I knelt down to kiss the Pope's ring. And he says, you'll never believe what the Pope said. And the barber says, what? And he says, where the hell did you get that lousy hair? <laughs> <laughs> and I was something like a negative barber, you know. I didn't know, but I'd heard, you know. And 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 I think a lot of us go through life that way. We learn better in Alcoholics Anonymous, Al Anon, or Alateen, but but we still, you know, we heard those things, and and by golly, they're kind of negative. So they told me to pray, and I said, "Who to?" And they said, "Doesn't matter, just pray." <laughs> And they said, at night when you go to bed, pray again. And I said, who do you pray to then? Doesn't matter. They said, just pray. And I listened to those people, and I started trying it, and, and by golly, it was working. And then it came to that third step, where it said, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood it. And now they're throwing that word God right at me. And so, I'm not much today, I still, I'm not much at making decisions. And I know there's a lot of people, I've been in the hiding here sometime in a, in a smorgue, and I know you can't make decisions either. I think that, that that's what holds those lineups up, you know. al trying to make decisions, whether they want a piece of chicken or a piece of meat, you know. And, and But anyway, you know, they're telling me i got to make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood it. And then he took this big book and he showed us something. He said, you don't have to look for God, you don't have to define God. He said, find out what your will is. And it tells you on page 60, and it just goes right on after it said, God couldn't, what if he were sought? He said, we're now at step three, and then it tells you all what your will is. And if you learn what your will is, you'll want to get rid of it. <laughs> you'll be glad to make a decision to turn it over. But most of us don't do that. We don't know what our will is. And we don't read the book to find out. But if we find out, I guarantee that we'll do something about it. And talking about making the decision, you know, the reason we don't want to make decisions is we're afraid we'll make the wrong decision. I had a friend of mine who went over to Ireland, and he's walking down the street, and the guy stuck a gun in his back. And he said, what are you? And the guy thought for a moment, he thought, well, if I say I'm Catholic, and he's Protestant, he'll shoot me. If I say I'm Protestant, he's Catholic, he'll shoot me. So he thought for a while, and he said, I'm Jewish. <laughs> and the guy with the gun says, I'm the luckiest Arab in the whole wide world. <laughs> <laughs> you see, sometimes you make the wrong decision, and it's tough. I, I just don't like making decisions. The night before coming up here, I was trying to decide whether I should go to the bathroom or not. And right now, I don't know whether I've made the right decision or not. <laughs> but but these, these decisions are tough things. I heard a story, I know down here, you probably don't know what a poacher is. Uh, you know, he's a guy that shoots out of season and without license and everything. Probably some of you know, but some of you wouldn't know down here. But we have him in camp. And uh, <clears throat> this old guy, he went fishing whenever he wanted to go fishing. A new game warden came to town. He went down, he put drop, dressed up in old overalls, and he went down, he made friends with his old poacher. And about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the old poacher told him, go and fish. And the game warden, who he didn't know was a game warden, said, like, go with you. So they went out in the middle of the stream, and he stopped the boat, and he reached over in a big can and tin box and he pulled out two sticks of dynamite he lit them <laughs> threw them into the drink boom up comes the fish out comes the net 
Builds the old boat up with fish, and out comes the bass. <laughs> and the old game warden just started to give him a lecture, I'll tell you. And the old poacher never bad an eye. Reached over, got two more sticks of dynamite. Lit them, handed them over to the game warden. <laughs> and the game warden is sitting there with two sticks of dynamite lit. <laughs> and the old poacher says, Look at buddy. Do you want to talk or do you want to fish? <laughs> <laughs> he made a decision, I'll tell you, you know. <laughs> but it tells you, and I, I had to keep it real simple. I just had to say, well, you know, God, I haven't done too good a job of managing my life. And, you know, apparently you're my new manager. So how about you taking it and uh, taking his will and, and looking after it? That's about as simple as I kept it. And I find out that everything I do in Alcoholics Anonymous, I have to keep it simple. If I start to complicate, I'm in trouble. I have a friend of mine back home that has a ranch. Another friend said to him, how did you get your name of the ranch? And he says, well, I wanted to call it the Barbecue. My wife wanted to call it Suzy Q. My daughter wanted to call it Suzy Barbecue. And my son wanted to call it the Bar Suzy Q. So we called it the Barbecue, Suzy Q, Suzy Barbecue, Bar Suzy Q. And the guy said, well, that's a great name, but where are the cattle? And he says, none of them ever survived the branding. <laughs> so... So you see, if we complicate things, we just may not survive the branding. And that's what would happen to me. But I made this decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood it. Now, lots of times when people are reading the steps, they'll say God is understand them. It's not God as I understand them. It's God as we understood him. And there's a big difference between understood and understand. And I'm not going to explain it to you. I'm just going to let you figure it out for yourself tonight. Stay awake all night, and you'll find many, many different answers. And then they went on to that beautiful four steps, where we had to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And old Ernie was a wise man. He heard somebody say one time that I can't find a pencil and a paper to get at this thing. So old Ernie brought his pencils, and he brought his paper. <laughs> Handed it out to us. Then he took this big book called Alcoholics Anonymous, turned to page 65, showed us the chart, and told us what we had to do. Now, if you people think that this is some stupid Canadian propaganda that I'm bringing down here, I want you to know that I bought this book in the United States. <laughs> and uh, and I want to thank you people for, for, for letting us buy it, because, uh, you know, it's made a big difference in my life and many, many Canadians. And he showed us this page 65 and showed us the chart and we wrote it down, and we went home that week, and by golly, we did step four, and I came back, and I wanted to show it to Ernie. I was so proud of it, and Ernie said, no, no, don't worry about that. He said, we'll find out what you have to do with it next week, and he asked us all if we'd done our step four. Everybody put their hands up just like good little students, and a lot of people say to me, I couldn't have done Alcoholics Anonymous that way. No way I could have. How do you know? Did you ever try that? You know, I, I didn't see them as no big deal. We, I was just trying to keep up with the rest of the group. <laughs> and I was egotistical enough. I wasn't going to be left behind, I'll tell you. So I did what they asked me to do. And then it went on to step five, where it said, admit it to God, to ourselves, to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. And a lot of people say we go and admit, admit to another human being. That's not what the step tells us. step tells us, admit it to God, to ourselves, and then to another human being. So I had to go into a bathroom and talk to my God as I understood him. Then I had to rush to the mirror and talk to me about this thing. And somewhere between from there to there, I got the stories mixed up. And I had to go back and have another discussion with God, because I'm a great guy for changing things, regardless of, you know, depending who I'm talking to. But then I finished that conversation with God and with me, and then I went to another human being. And I went to a little preacher that I was very close to. He was my own preacher, Protestant, mind you. And uh, I went to him, and, and we, uh, we had a good conversation, a really, really good conversation. And I can remember he knew all about Alcoholics Anonymous, and he knew, uh, you know, he knew what we had to do. And then when we were all finished with Step 5 that night, and we did a good job, or he did a good job because... He was an experienced man, and he got everything out of me. 
He had my step four in front of him, and he got other things out of me because he knew how to do that. He just got me talking, and I talked. And I came out of there, and it says, he said, you know what you have to do now? And I said, yes, I have to read step six and seven. And I took down this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it says, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. And it tells you to review the last five proposals. It tells us that tells me that I'm building an archway to which I can walk a free man. And then it tells me on the next page that there's a step six to this program. And it says that we have to be entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. And then it tells me in step seven, it says, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Now, as I told you, I hadn't stopped gambling. And gambling was causing me a lot of problems. And if it's causing me a lot of problems, it's got to be a defect of character. So I asked God to remove the obsession to gamble. And I don't have to gamble anymore. If somebody tonight said they were having a big game and I like making money and I probably could, you know, take some money from some of you marks, but I don't want to do that. I, I, I just, I, I, I'm not saying I don't gamble, but I haven't got that obsession. I don't m- make games or I don't go looking for games. And uh, I can gamble, but it's no big deal anymore because the obsession disappeared. I used to swear a lot. And I realized that I was in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what really, you know, got me to watch myself, especially day AA meeting, was there was a businessman in our town, and he was having a bad time. His wife was going to Al-Anon, and one day she was in my store, and she said, I said, I hear something. I'd heard he'd gone to a meeting. And I said, I hear there's some good news at your place. And she said, uh, well, I don't really know. And I said, well, didn't he go to a meeting? She said, yeah. And I said, well, how did he enjoy it? And she said, I don't know. He came home, and I asked him, and he said, well, they prayed a little. They swore a lot. They prayed a little more, and they had a cup of coffee, and we went home, you know. And I just hope that I never have to belong to a group like that, because that scared that poor fellow, and I doubt very much if he ever went back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's a sad thing. And today I don't have to swear from this podium. And I don't think I've got any right to swear from this podium. You may have brought your mother. You may have brought your sister. You may have brought somebody to this meeting that you want to show them what you belong to. And you're proud of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if I was to get up here and cuss and swear, you know, I'm sure that they wouldn't be too impressed. And so I just don't want to scare anybody away from Alcoholics Anonymous by my profanity, and I don't have to because I asked for help. I had a tough time with step seven, the humility part, because I realized I had to get down on my knees. And I, I just had a difficult time by getting down on my knees because I hadn't done it since I'd been living with my grandmother and going to Sunday school. And I was in New York once, and there was a fellow there by the name of Shy Walker, and Shy was a delegate. And Shy told how he... You know, he had, came out of prison, and he so much wanted to stay sober, and he wanted to pray, and he wanted to get on his knees, but he just couldn't. But one night he came home, and he was working in construction work, and he had high-top boots, and he said he kicked the boots under his bed. And he said the next morning he got down on his knees to get the boots from under the bed. And he decided that when he was down there, he was going to say a few words. And every night he used to boot his boots under the bed so that the next morning he'd get down and he'd say a few words. I don't know whether it worked with high top boots or didn't have any at that time, but I know that it worked with ordinary shoes because I tried it. I don't have to boot them under the bed anymore. I can pray whenever I want to pray. And believe me, it's a wonderful feeling. Step 8 told me that I had to make another list of all the people I'd harmed and become willing to make amends to them all. And I made that list. I put my own name on that list because I'd lost my self-respect in my own hometown. And I didn't know how to forgive myself. And I wanted to talk to somebody about it. And I made the list, and I made a story list. And in step nine, I went about and did what I was supposed to do. You see, Ernie, every every meeting that we went to, Ernie read something that was so beautiful. He read the promises to us. And he would say, you're entitled to this. Don't jip yourself. This is what you're entitled to. And he'd say, read it and I'll share it with you. I know you all know what it is, but I love to read it because I know all of these promises are true. It says, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. 
We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past and wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of usefulness, uselessness, and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in ourselves, in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. And when we took that step nine, Ernie said, those are the promises I've been telling you about. Those are the promises we've been reading at every meeting. And all of a sudden, I had those promises by doing those steps in secret. And I'll give every anybody in this room, and that whether you're an al anon Alateen or Alcoholics Anonymous, I'll give you an absolute guarantee that you can have those promises if you take those steps in secret. They're all there, and you're entitled to them. Don't jip yourself. Get what's coming to you. Because those promises are there. They're there for us. And there's no other way that I know of getting them unless we do those steps in sequence. It says half measures avail us nothing. And so this is what I had to do. And then step 10 told me that I had to continue to take a personal inventory and when I was wrong, promptly admit it. Each and every night when I go to bed, I have to take a look at seats. When I'm doing business, when I'm doing on the plane today, a lady put her suitcase up top. And I didn't know it was one of those deals that pulled down. And I said, honey, I, I, I think they'll make you take that down because I couldn't see the thing. You know, it was right in. And then I saw, then she, and she was a sweet old lady, and by the time I got up to help her, she'd taken it down herself. And uh, by the time that, you know, the, the girl came, the stewardess came along, started putting the things down, and I realized that she would had a terrible time putting her stuff down in front of her. And I got up and I, I told her that I was wrong and I'd like to put the thing up. And, and you know, one time, there's no way that I could have done that. I would have been hiding behind a paper, you know, pretending to wonder what that poor old lady was doing sitting there, you know, and she was uncomfortable because the thing didn't fit under the seat. And I was able to do that. that, that and that's no big deal. But I was wrong, so I promptly admitted it. And I was able to fall asleep on the airplane instead of sitting there watching that poor old lady, you know. And that's, that's what you want in this program. You want to be comfortable. And there's times in my life, especially at home, you know, when you're wrong, you promptly admit. Probably at 7.30 some mornings, just as you're leaving the house. And some of those people that we live with, they don't realize that, you know, that we're as sensitive as we are. And, and they're not wide awake and they say bad things to us, you know. And we react, and, and we say bad things to them. And we get in an argument. And I'll tell you, the best way to stop an argument is just put on a big smile and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> they don't know what to say. <laughs> they haven't got a clue what to say. They just stand there and kiss them goodbye and away you're gone, you know. And then you can drive your car sensibly. You don't drive down a stupid broad, you know. I mean... <laughs> I think that more accidents are caused by alcoholics who are going to work mad at their wives or wives going to work mad at their husbands than drunk drivers, you know. There's a lot of accidents you'll notice between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock in the morning. And I'll tell you that, it, that, it, that it's just beautiful because I can, I can admit I'm wrong and, and, uh, and I can just do what I'm supposed to do. And at nighttime, I can have a look at myself. And the reason Step 10 is so important to me is I call step 10, 11, and 12 growth steps in Alcoholics Anonymous. Somebody along the line said that you got to grow or you got to go. And I believe that to be true. I don't call them maintenance steps. I call them growth steps. And you see, I found out in Alcoholics Anonymous that if I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing, <laughs> like when somebody gets in, in trouble, it's not usually what they're doing that causes that trouble. It's what they're not doing that allows them to do what they're doing. <laughs> that makes sense. And, and, God, I just thought of that. And, and, but, but, 
But you see, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I don't do those things. And so I found out in Alcoholics Anonymous, as I went along and, and was getting along real good, that I could get restless, irritable, and discontented. But these steps can bring me back where I'm not restless, irritable, or discontented. And the steps that can do that is steps 10, 11, and 12. When I was sober 10 years, I became Mr. AA of Prince Albert. I became a Central Avenue big shot in my business. And man, oh man, was I ever doing real great things. I'd been one of the youngest delegates in Alcoholics Anonymous and, and just was doing great things in AA. And I was going to meetings. Never missed a meeting, but I was going with attitudes. I'm like this, you lucky people. Here I am, you know. Some of you want a little counseling after the meeting. I maybe spend a couple of minutes with you, you know. I was going out to the penitentiary every Tuesday night. My way out, I was thinking thoughts, something like this. These guys sure are lucky. I have old cease come out here every week, you know. And one day, I, I had a big job. I told you about that, and, and uh, my job had got bigger over the years. And, and I was managing the largest ladies' wear store in the province of Saskatchewan. I was looking after the fur department for five stores. And it was, I thought I had a big job, you know, big car, expense account, on radio and television all the time, a picture in the paper, you know, God, it's just beautiful. And one day, my boss, we had the biggest store in Prince Albert, and that's where myself and my boss was, where, and, and he called me into the office one morning, and he had decided that the store wasn't big enough for the two of us. <laughs> And it seemed he wasn't about to leave. <laughs> and he fired the great sea squirrel. Imagine that. And I walked out of that store with an attitude something like this. Well, they won't last long now. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know that was in 1960, and they're still there, and they're still millionaires, and they're doing all right. And I, uh, at that time, I had a little cousin who belonged to Alcoholics Anonymous, and she came to visit me. I, I know she was the west coast of Canada in Vancouver. I know she just didn't come to visit me. I know that she was sent to visit me by a power greater than ourselves, which I prefer to call God. And I had all this money from when there's, I don't know what kind of pay they call it, but they give you extra money when they fire you. And, and uh, I went downtown and bought myself some new clothes, and I went down to see Fern, and I stood up in front of her in my big egotistical way, and I said, well, kid, how do I look? <laughs> and Fern said, just a little something like this, but it has meant so much to me because she brought me back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had never been away. I had never missed meetings, but I wasn't really an Alcoholics Anonymous. And she said, you look real good on the outside, Cease, but how are you really on the inside? That weekend, I had to go to a roundup about 250 miles away. And I went with a dear old fellow by the name of Dave Murray. And I went to that roundup, and then I went into Winnipeg, Manitoba, because I was trying to figure out what I had to do with my future. And I spent a couple of days in a hotel room just talking to God, reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I went back to Prince Albert and went in business for myself. There's no big deal. I had to do something, and that's what I did. But I went back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I can remember going to the penitentiary meeting that night. Say, boy, is it ever great to be back with the guys. You know, I wasn't thinking how lucky you are that I'm coming out here. Just because I had come back to Alcoholics Anonymous with the proper motive and the proper attitude. Just because that little girl said that to me. And so that's why I know that step 10 is so great. And never again do I ever want to go through what I went through that summer. And I don't have to because if I become restless, irritable, and discontented, I know what to do. I can just take step 10, 11, and 12. And I can stay that, stay the way I want to be. Step 11 said to me, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood it, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Every morning, no matter where I am, I have a little room at home. I go into that room and I read page 86, 87, and 88 of the big book called Alcoholics Anonymous. I read the prayer on page 63, and I read the prayer on page 76. I read the last part of a vision for you. And I read other things. I may read something by Emmett Fox. I may read something by Vincent Thiel. I may even read the Bible. I know it's not conference approved literature, Phyllis, but <laughs> we'll try it anyway, you know. And I have prayer and meditation in that little room. I call it seven minutes with God. 
Sometimes it takes longer. But I get up and I make sure I have it. And the reason I do that is because one morning I found myself going to work, having an argument with a guy that wasn't there. He was in Vancouver, British Columbia. I was going to meet him in British in in Montreal. And he and I had had an argument on the phone, and so we were going to have a little chat <laughs> when we got to Montreal, I knew. So I started the argument that morning. And it got so bad, I started arguing out loud. <laughs> you know, in, in a town my size, I do a television show with fashions, and everybody knows me. And I'd come to a stop sign, and I'd be talking to this guy that wasn't there. <laughs> People looking, you know, what's wrong with old seats this morning, you know? And, and I got to my store, and I hadn't finished the argument. And I drove around the block a couple of times because <laughs> I had some more things to tell him. And I went into my store at quarter to nine in the morning completely exhausted. And I decided that there was a better way to live. So each and every, I don't like arguing with people that aren't there. So each and every morning what I do is I do my reading. And I have my prayer and I have my meditation. And I want to tell you why I do that. It's because you never know who's out there to get you. <laughs> you know, you've got to be ready for them. I can go to work. It could be uh, it could be a bank manager. I went in one morning and he phoned me up and he put me. I don't know what you call it down here, it's number eleven or something, but it's a receivership up there. It's when he and an accountant take your business over, and I wasn't ready for that, you know. But because I'd done my reading that morning, I was able to accept it, and I was also able to get out of it because of my attitude. Uh, it may be a manufacturer, it may be a lady that's not too happy with her fur coat or something, you know, it could be anything. But if I've done my reading, I don't have to react to people. I don't have to act like an idiot the way I used to, if I'm ready for it. There's another story I like to tell about an old poacher. His name was Ralph. <laughs> and he tried, or the, the games warden's name was Ralph, and he tried to catch his old poacher tried for years, and he couldn't catch him. One night he went down, and he bedded down in front of his old poacher's shack, and he thought, I'll catch him when he comes out in the morning, because sure as heck he'll do something that's not supposed to do. Four o'clock in the morning, the old door creaked open from the old poacher's shack, and he thought, the old Ralph thought, well, I got him now. <laughs> and the old poacher poked his head out, and he said, do you want some breakfast, Ralph? <laughs> And Ralph come out of the hay frozen, and he went in the house, and he's having some breakfast at the old shack. And he said to the old poacher, he said, uh, how come you knew I was out there? The old poacher says, I didn't, but every morning for the past five years, I open the door and say, you want some breakfast, Ralph? Because <laughs> you see, you got to be ready. <laughs> and that's what Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me. And I want to share something that happened while I was doing my prayer and meditation and my reading one time. I told you that I had a difficult time with Catholic people. Well, I still do a little bit. But uh, my oldest daughter, uh, we gave Faye everything possible that she wanted. And you'll never believe what she did. That's right. She married a Catholic. You know, an Italian one. They're the worst kind. <laughs> and she has two of the most beautiful they have two of the most beautiful little daughters you've ever seen one of them little Anna ought to know she was in Montreal with me and uh, she just really enjoyed herself but she came home with me I, she was living in just outside of Toronto and every time I'd be that way I'd go to see them and this one time I got there and she was three years old and, and she was all packed ready to come home with grandpa so I got her ticket, and she came home, and, and uh, first morning she was home, I was doing my reading, and she came, and she was knocking at my door, and Babe says, honey, you can't go in there, Gramps is doing his reading, and she said, well, there's something I want to tell him, so I opened the door, and I took her up on my knee and tried to explain to her what I was doing, and I said, what did you want to tell me, and she said, I wanted to tell you that I love you, <laughs> and I said, I want you to know that I love you, too. Now, that may not mean anything to anybody out there, but here was an old hard rock that came to Alcoholics Anonymous at 27 years of age. I couldn't give love. I couldn't accept love. And here this little Catholic girl is telling me she loves me, and I'm telling her I love her. You know, you talk about the miracle. Her name is Anna Louisa. She has a little sister called Chella Maria. And she just leaps up on my knee anytime she wants and gives me a kiss, tells me she loves me, and I tell her I love her. And we just have a great time. And uh, they have a little cousin. His name is Jason. And he, too, is in Montreal. He, he, he was in 
New Orleans. He's got more international conferences than most grown up people. But he and I go everywhere together. We were on the phone to him tonight because he's a computer freak. And I met another computer freak over here, and I, I'm supposed to buy something for him. So I, I got my friend here to phone him and <laughs> find out what he really wanted. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, he and I go a lot of places together just have a great time. And one night we were washing the car and he saw Kentucky Fried Chicken over there and he said, Grandpa, why don't we buy some Kentucky Fried Chicken for Grandma for supper? And I said, that's a good idea, Jason. And he said, well, why don't we add, maybe we should get some for ourselves. <laughs> and uh, I don't know about him, he's pretty swift. And of course, he's a Protestant too, it makes him a little swifter. But, <laughs> but we... Uh, we got the chicken, and we went home, and they have a little table and chairs at our house. This is several years ago. And uh, he asked me to sit there down at that little table, and we're sitting there. And he said, uh, you know what I want to be when I grow up, Grandpa? And I said, what do you want to be, Jason? He said, I want to be a grandpa. And he said, I want to have a store, and I want to be the boss. That is the greatest compliment, folks, that I ever got, had in my life. He's a little guy that wanted to be like me. And he still wants to be like me. And I could have lost all of that. I could have lost all of that even in Alcoholics Anonymous. But I have that today. He wants to be like me. And that's just great. Jason's mom got divorced from Jason's daddy. And she too married an Italian Catholic. And uh, that, you know, I know now what it means, uh, you know, keep an open mind and live and let live. I, I know what those slogans are all about. <laughs> and uh, they have they they have a little fella. <laughs> He's twenty months old, and his name is uh, Giovanni Anthony. <laughs> I don't know how the hell you spell it, but it's uh, 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 that's that's his name. And he's the greatest little fella, and he and I are pals, and, and we dance together, and he was we have a great time. And you know, all of those kids are mine, and they're. They love me, and I love them. And it's just just beautiful. All because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I could have lost all of that. I could have lost it before I came to AA. I could have certainly lost it after I got here, too. And last, uh, at the end of the, when we started back to school this year, I don't know who arranged this. It sure wasn't me. But Jason is now going to a Catholic school. <laughs> and last Saturday night I was speaking at a convention and I come home and I find out he was at a Catholic youth conference or something, you know. They just don't stop. They just keep coming at you, you know. And and I have to drive those kids to school sometimes, you know. Boy, you got to have an open mind driving kids to a French Catholic school. And, and uh, you know, when the sisters come out, they say, good morning, Mr. Cord. <laughs> I say, hi, sisters, how are you? And give them the old peps and smile, you know. But all of those things... I can accept, you know. I can accept it, and as a matter of fact, I love it because I've learned how to accept those things because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And isn't that great? Where you can have an open mind and keep an open mind and live and let live. That's really something else. Then it came to that 12th step where it says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Spiritual awakening to me is simply a personality change. Personality change is something where this morning at 4.30, I got up, I had to drive 100 miles to catch an airplane, and I was in the bathroom, and I, I didn't say, holy malarca, I have to go to Lincoln, Nebraska today, you know? I said, isn't it terrific? Because I'm shaving that they invite me back again this year. That's a personality change. If I was the other way, I could have been played out before I got out of the bathroom, you know? But I don't have to get tired like that anymore. That's a personality change. Personality change is where I can walk down the street of my hometown and smile at people and be friends. This past year in my hometown, they made me citizen of the year. May not mean a big deal to any of you people out there. But when I got home that night, when the whole thing hit the paper and the television and the radio, and I said, babe, <laughs> when they, those ladies came to see you when I was in hospital, did they mention that this might happen? <laughs> and, and, and babe said that she hadn't given it much thought either. <laughs> but uh, 
you know, and they had a they had a big banquet, and they had it in a huge hall, and they sold out. They they the place was jam packed full, and and a lot of people said a lot of nice things about the old drum. You know, isn't that fantastic? That a member of Alcoholics Anonymous that can happen to them, not because I set out to be citizen of the year, simply because my attitude was right when I walked down the street, and I did what I was supposed to do. I served my community the way I was taught to serve Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is the greatest thing that can happen to us. The greatest opportunity that any man can ever have, the late King George once said, is the opportunity to serve his fellow man. And that's the opportunity that we have, every one of us, in our community. And that's what happened. And I'm not saying it in a bragging way, folks. I'm saying it in a very grateful way, the fact that they would do that to me in my own hometown. Because that is, you know, I never expected it. And I never expected it could happen. But because of Alcoholics Anonymous, it did. And it says we try to carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. How do we carry that message? We carry the message, first of all, probably the way of what I'm doing tonight. We carry the message by the way we act as we do our job or as we live in our home. That is where it's based on attraction rather than promotion. Where well, people are watching us, and one day someone's going to walk up to us and say, I understand you don't drink. And they're going to say, how did you stop drinking? And you're going to smile and tell them that you joined Alcoholics Anonymous, and you're going to share your story with them. This has happened to me so many times. Otto has been up to our town. Phyllis has been up to our town. They know the number of people that I'm, I guess, responsible for, that I sponsor. And and I don't want to brag about that. I'm just grateful that people come to me and allow me to do that. Fantastic thing. All because I'm an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then it says, practice these principles in all our affairs. What principles are they talking about? They're talking about the principles that we learned as we went through those steps. Each one of those steps is a principle. And that's the principles that they're talking about. And we're allowed to do that. And there's a little prayer that I try to use every night. And I'm going to share it with you, but be careful about it when you say it. It's a little prayer that I learned from my grandmother. And that little prayer is, Please, God, treat me tomorrow as I've treated everybody today. <laughs> be real careful about that. And I try to say that every night. And if I can't say it, I apologize to God why I can't say it. And it's just beautiful. And when we're in Montreal... I was in charge of the charter that took all the people down from Prince Alberton District. And the fellow that worked for the travel agency gave Anna and Jason and I a real nice suite. And, and Anna was on one side in the big bedroom and Jason and I on the other side. So we were going to say our prayers. And, and I said, let's go in and say our prayers with Anna. And we went and knocked on her door and said our prayers with her. And, and uh, we always say that. Please, God, treat us the more as we treat everybody today. And I can remember a knock came to our door, and little Anna came in, and she's 15 years old now. And she put her arms around me and thanked me for being her grandpa and thanked me for taking her to the international conference and just thanked me for everything that's ever happened. And, you know, those things, I guess, are something that I am so grateful that uh, I've had those things happen to me because of prayer, because of meditation, because what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I like to tell a little story, and of course it's a story that you people all know. It's a story about a little town just outside of Omaha, Nebraska, a little place called Boys Town. And as you drive up this little town, you see a statue, and it's a statue of one little boy carrying another little boy. You can see, by the way, he's bent over and by the sweat on his brow that he's having a difficult time. But underneath there are simple words, something like this. No, Lord, he is not heavy, for he is my brother. And isn't that nice? That's what we have in Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to thank the committee for inviting me to Lincoln, Nebraska. I want to thank you, the audience, for being such a tremendous audience because you've listened and you've made it possible for me to speak and not get interrupted. Last but not least, I want to thank God for giving me one more beautiful day to allow me to do something, probably a purpose in life, that I'm supposed to do, and that's carry the message to somebody that's so suffering. 
And I'm going to close this talk with something that helped me so very, very much when I was sober 10 years. Everybody out there looks real good on the outside. How are you really on the inside? Thank you and God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.